Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there, this is Dee, and welcome to episode 29 of the Benzo Free Podcast. Oh, i like to give you an update on the ongoing saga of Where Did Your Email Go? The show where some emails are received, some are sent, but we really don't know which is which. I just sent out an email to um, our mailing list talking about the continuing saga of the email issues here at Benzo Free. I thought they were resolved for the second time, but it appears they are still ongoing. Now, as I mentioned in the email out to the mailing list, I am receiving emails, including ones from the feedback form, but I can't send replies. And I said some because not all of them. According to my beloved hosting provider, he says with a sneer, uh, some of my outgoing emails from benzofree.org domain are being blocked by an outgoing spam filter. I, I didn't even know there was such a thing as an outgoing spam filter. Anyway, this may be linked to the malware attack earlier this month, but I'm not sure yet, and they are looking into it again. If it wasn't such a big headache, I would just switch hosting providers, and I still might, but that is a big headache, and it's one I don't want to undertake if I don't have to. So, just to remind everybody, if you commented or sent an email to me in the last week or two, and again, have not received a reply from me, it may be this time that I got your message, but you didn't receive my reply because it got blocked. I am truly sorry and embarrassed by the situation. I will do my best to see if I can get the hosting provider to identify which ones were blocked, but I don't know if they will do that, so we'll see what happens. But enough for now. Let's move on to the rest of the podcast. <laughs> Last week, I featured depersonalization and derealization as our feature topic, and I received some really good response from that. Thank you for that. In that feature, I mentioned a movie starring Matthew Perry titled Numb, which was about DPDR. It was written and directed by Harris Goldberg, who has dealt with depersonalization himself. In the episode last week, I mentioned that I'd never seen the movie due to possible triggers that I was having during withdrawal, but now I thought I could check it out, and I did. So the other night, my wife and I watched the film, and it was interesting. First off, I do want to provide possible trigger warnings about the movie. If you haven't seen it yet, and you're struggling with depersonalization or derealization or anxiety or especially benzos, which many of you are, it might not be the movie to watch right now. Um, there are a lot of triggers in it, and it could be difficult. In, in my opinion, the movie was okay. Not stellar by any accounts, but still, any movie which attempts to shine the light on those of us who invisibly suffer from mental health conditions, it deserves some credit. But still, it had a few interesting points of interest I'd like to comment on. No spoilers here. I'm not going to give away any major plot points, I promise. In the movie, the main character, Hudson Milbank, suddenly experiences depersonalization after smoking weed one night. He thinks the weed may have caused this sensation, but eventually that idea gets dispelled. Now, here's the part that makes me, well, a little upset, to put it mildly. Hudson goes to see a psychiatrist, who almost immediately prescribes him, wait for it, wait for it, <laughs> you're already there, aren't you? Yes? A benzo. <laughs> he prescribes him clonazepam or clonopin without any warning. Now, this must be a Hollywood picture because I'm sure that never happens in real life. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, Hudson takes the drugs and they don't help him. 
and his condition gets worse. And then later in the movie, he goes back to the psychiatrist, who later tells him to stop taking the clonazepam cold turkey. Yes, the psychiatrist tells him just to stop taking the drug so that he could start another drug, an antipsychotic, I think. <laughs> now, many of you are shaking your heads in disbelief as I am, but this is the message that is sent, as we all know. The message is thus, benzos are safe and no warnings are needed, and you can stop taking them without any complications. Now, most of you know that is not reality, not by a long shot. But this is the common belief, and we still have a long way to go to try and change it. Now, the movie was definitely less than flattering of psychiatrists, and many of you might agree with that portrayal. It also seemed quite focused on their degrees and their schools of training, which surprised me since that isn't something I really ever think about, but perhaps it's important to some. Anyway, the only person who appeared to have any idea of how to help him was a psychologist, again with an amazing pedigree of education. And she attempted some exposure therapy with Hudson with some success, but... Well, I can't elaborate on that one without a few spoilers, so I'll stop there. Let me just say that the one person who actually might have been able to help him was no longer available. The poly-drugging of mental health patients was definitely a cornerstone of this movie, and it was good that they showed that situation, which so many of you have experienced, but I really wish they would have spent some time focusing on withdrawal and what happens when people stop taking these medications or have been taking them for a long time. It would be nice to have that covered in a feature film. As for DPDR, I think it did an okay job. Attempting to relay the actual distress caused by this condition is difficult and I think it may have felt short. Then again, how do you really relay this condition to someone who has never experienced it? Well, this is not a movie review podcast, thank God. I've spent my time in the film industry, and I'm happy I've moved on, and I'm here with you now. I'm speaking on a podcast to you, someone whom I've never met, but who I feel kinship towards because of what we've gone through, and that feels good. It's, a, it's really nice to be in a community where our feelings are meaningful and deep, and our connection is strong versus Hollywood and the film community I came out of, which was kind of the opposite to all of that. <laughs> anyway, there's no place I'd rather be than here talking to you, honest. Let's move on. As many of you know, I wrote a book about benzos. I know, I know, this is news to you. <laughs> I, I do mention it from time to time, even though I try not to do it too much. Sorry if I get carried away, but still, it is out there for anyone to read if they like, so check it out if you're interested. I put a link to it in the show notes again. But that is not the reason I brought it up in the intro today. I, I need your help. For those of you who have read my book, I, I'd love it if you'd post a review on Amazon. You see, the thing is it's hard to get people to review things. Since I published 10 months ago, I've sold a couple hundred books so far, and I'm very grateful to everyone who bought a copy. But unfortunately, I have only a few reviews on Amazon, and, and I'd love to have more feedback there. So if you have read the book, and you have a few moments, would you mind leaving a review? And even if you didn't purchase the book from Amazon, but you have an Amazon account, you can still leave a review there. Just go to Amazon.com, search for Benzo Free, scroll down to the reviews, and click on Write a Customer Review. That's it. I'll leave a link in the show notes to make it easier if that helps. And as for our format, today's format will follow our normal routine. We have our intro, mailbag, and benzo story, and we'll close out with our moment of peace. Our feature today is Muscular Symptoms in Benzo Withdrawal. This is part 10 of our 14-part series on the symptoms of benzo withdrawal. We will discuss muscle issues like tears, pulls, strains, and sprains, ticks, jerks, and spasms, tension, headaches, and even touch on seizures and convulsions. And just in case you thought I forgot, we need feedback. Even if I can't reach you right now, hopefully you can still reach me. We need questions, comments, stories, suggestions, corrections, additions, or 
anybody's explanation of how the hell I can fix my email problem. <laughs> I need feedback. This is your podcast, and the more content I can share from you, the more Benzo Free becomes a community it was designed to be. So please let me know what you think. Visit our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback or email us at podcast at benzofree.org. Or, as I often forget, you can comment directly on the podcast blog post itself for others to see. So even though we don't have a Facebook page, this is still a good place to share comments if you choose. And don't forget to sign up for the mailing list at benzofree.org slash subscribe when you visit the website. And please remember that the Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. If you're listening to this podcast on one of our providers, please leave feedback on that carrier. This helps new listeners find us. Okay, let's move on to our mailbag. But you know what? Before we get into the actual questions, I want to include this invitation here. As you know, I am not a medical expert or even anything close to it. I've learned a few things about benzos, anxiety, happiness, etc. along the way, but no more than anyone else who likes to read. Thus, there are times, plenty of times, when I don't know the answer to the questions you submit. Now, most of the time when this happens, I'll do some research and try and find some information to relay back to you, which I will, of course, continue to do. But there is another huge untapped resource out there which I don't want to neglect, and that's you. Each of us tries different tools, techniques, supplements, diets, exercises, distractions, you name it, during our withdrawal. Some work and some don't, and some will work for you but not for others. But still, you have learned along the way just as I have. So if you have some information that might help out any of the following listeners who have asked questions here in our mailbag, please send them in to me on our feedback form or at podcast at benzofree.org. I can share your response with your name or anonymously if you like, or just incorporate it as background into an overall response. My knowledge is limited, but yours is endless. There's a lot of you out there, and I welcome any input you might have. Now, that being said, let's move on with our mailbag. Today, I have two questions. This one is from our good friend Terry in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Terry writes, I am wrestling histamine and chemical sensitivity again, including my last vice, two cups of coffee. I had an episode yesterday of heat intolerance after my daily walk. I got dizzy and felt faint. I drank a Gatorade and water to revive myself somewhat. Honest to Pete, I don't know where the next head slap is going to come from. And I too have blood pressure issues upon standing up too quick. Thanks, Terry. We addressed this topic somewhat in episode 24 and discussed how the vagus nerve was involved with withdrawal. Today I want to look at a few other aspects of these symptoms to see if we can learn a few new things. In episode 20 we spoke about head and neck symptoms of withdrawal and I mentioned my experience with vertigo and dizziness. As I mentioned I had vertigo and dizziness for years while I was taking a benzo but I didn't know what was causing it and now I do. It would hit me out of the blue for no reason, and I would have to lie down for an hour or two, sometimes a full day, until the room stopped spinning, until I didn't want to throw up anymore, until, until the sensation subsided. When I withdrew, this type of dizziness eased, and I was glad to see it go. But I did develop low blood pressure during withdrawal and still have it today. Due to this low blood pressure, when I stand, especially if I've been squatting or kneeling for a minute or two, I get dizzy and have to just freeze. The good news for me is that unlike the vertigo I used to have, this usually passes in about 10 or 15 seconds, and I'm fine again. As Terry mentioned, histamine is a compound which may be a factor in this symptom. Histamines are chemicals made in the immune system, which respond to allergens and other allergic triggers. Histamines regulate immune responses and influences inflammation, digestion, and our central nervous system. This includes dilation of the blood vessels, which, among other things, lowers blood pressure, causing dizziness and lightheadedness. Another aspect of these symptoms might be dehydration. 
Before benzos, I used to drink water all the time. I couldn't get enough of it. Unfortunately, during and after withdrawal, I started drinking less water, and I started to become aware of the consequences. I believe that dehydration is a significant problem in withdrawal, and one we don't talk about enough, especially when one has urinary or digestive issues from withdrawal like I did, it's easy to get in the habit of drinking less fluids. In addition, for those who are still drinking coffee, tea, or eating chocolate, caffeine is a diuretic and only makes this condition worse, and that goes double for alcohol. Since it is not only a diuretic, but it also affects the GABA receptors directly while you're trying to let them heal, most experts recommend abstaining from alcohol during benzo use and withdrawal. So if you're substituting caffeinated or alcoholic drinks for water, you may want to seriously consider changing your drinking habits. Complications from dehydration can run the gamut. These include urinary problems, pain, especially in the lower abdomen, discomfort, headaches, joint pain, muscle strains and pulls, migraines, and so many others. Make sure you are drinking enough fluids, healthy fluids like good old water during withdrawal. It's so easy to let your body become dehydrated, as I know all too well. Again, like so many other groups of symptoms in benzo withdrawal, there are a lot of factors at play here, and it can be confusing to try and identify one trigger or cause. Our next question is from Julie in Canyon Lake, Texas. Julie writes, I fried my brain 32 months ago by unwittingly stopping Valium cold turkey. For years, I had used Valium occasionally for sleep. I then began overusing Valium for sleep, a total of three years due to extreme life stress. I am a natural healer, believe it or not, whose kids never had an antibiotic or went to the doctor except for checkups. Once I realized what I had done to myself, with no help, of course, from Western doctors, I began the painful, extremely lonely journey of how to save my brain. I researched and studied as best as I could at first, as I was dealing with the hell of major stress, depression, and insomnia. Anywho, I want to know if anyone has introduced small amounts of green tea, L-theanine, after, let's say, two or three years of recovery. You know, to help brain receptors heal and proliferate. Of course, I learned from my own trial and error research that L-theanine antagonist wrecks havoc on a newly damaged benzo brain. But I thought that it might aid with healing once the brain receptors are calmed down and working better. I do not know how blogs work, so I do not know if I will receive a response on how to hear the answer to my query. I do hope that I hear back, though. All the best, Julie. Well, first off, thanks, Julie. Um, I did respond to Julie's comment immediately. I hope she got that response. <laughs> As we all know, with my mail problems, she very well may not have, and I will try to resend that once I get things working again. But I do respond to every comment and email I receive. So if you have not received a response from me, it's not for lack of trying on my part, I promise you. Let me just give a little background on this one. Information I'm sure Julie already knows, but that some of you may not be aware. The green tea question is a good one. As I told Julie, I drank green tea often during my withdrawal. And I finally had to stop to some degree because it upset my stomach. At the time, I did not know that it could also slow my recovery. And along with so many other things I did, I have no idea if it complicated things for me or not. The chemical L-theanine, often found in green tea and in some mushrooms, is an amino acid, and it is often thought to promote relaxation while not making you sleepy. It has been used for treating anxiety, high blood pressure, inflammation, and may help improving your quality of sleep. It has also been suggested that L-theanine may help with increased focus, better immunity, and even as a cancer treatment to improve the efficacy of chemotherapy. According to the FDA, L-theanine is generally recognized as safe. 
This means that it is generally safe when used as directed. But, and there's always a but in there, isn't there? There is a downside, especially when it comes to benzos and withdrawal. Theanine actually boosts levels of GABA and other calming chemicals and can even block glutamate or at least reduce glutamate's effectiveness. If you've listened to this podcast very long, you well know about GABA and glutamate and how they are affected by benzos and withdrawal. Much like theanine, benzos also boost the effects of GABA, and that didn't turn out very well for so many of us. According to an article in Psychology Today, if you are in any of the following groups, you should consult your physician before using theanine as a supplement. This group includes pregnant women, those who are breastfeeding, those with low blood pressure like myself and Terry who asked the question before this one, and children. So during withdrawal, it might be a good idea to be cautious about consumption of L-theanine, especially in supplement form. Common sense among the benzo community often supports the belief that it is best to allow your GABA receptors to heal naturally, and any substance which affects them directly only complicates your withdrawal. Even though this is just my opinion, I have to agree with that theory. In my experience, allowing your body to heal with as little interference as you can usually provides a more successful withdrawal. As I've said before in this podcast, our bodies are amazing, and they can recover from some of the most hideous assaults we can throw at them, including years of dependence on benzos. Your body is attempting to restore its balance through homeostasis, and the best thing I can think of is to let it. But remember, I am not a medical professional, and this is not medical advice. Now, much of the information I just talked about, Julie probably already knew. Her question was actually about after withdrawal, a a year or two. And this is where we lack solid information. In my opinion, and you're going to hate me for saying this again, everybody's different. To each their own. Use trial and error. If you feel that green tea or supplements are causing a return of symptoms, then stop it for a while and see where you are. In general, I try to go as medication and supplement free as I can. And I'm constantly surprised at how well my body recovers when I don't interfere with that process. Green tea is a healthy drink, one I am fond of. But just be cautious and monitor any type of additional chemical, drug, food, drink, or whatever you ingest during your recovery. Things can complicate benzo withdrawal that don't cause problems for anybody else in the world out there. Our systems have been assaulted by a medication, and we're recovering, and we don't respond normally to most substances. I hope that helps. Please, like I said at the beginning of our mailbag, if any of you out there have any additional information for Julie, let me know, and I'll share it in a later episode. And that closes out our mailbag today. Now, on to our benzo story. Today I have a success story from Rick in Charleston, South Carolina. Rick writes, Dark Night of the Soul In 2007, I was promoted to VP of Business Development for a Southwest engineering firm. I was having trouble flying on planes, and my family doctor prescribed Ativan, as needed, that I could take one hour before I flew. It worked so well I started taking it at night when I traveled for sleep. Never was I told not to take for a long period of time. That same year the economy was slowing, and as an officer I had to take a pay cut. I became depressed, and the doctor prescribed an SSRI, Prozac. I thought I would go crazy. He would try me on many medications, kept telling me it takes weeks for results. I kept telling him I felt weird, felt like my brain stopped working. I kept telling him the Ativan was not working. He switched my prescription to one milligram three times a day. I started seeing a counselor for depression. I started going for days without sleep. In 2011, my father died 
My youngest son graduated college, and my oldest son married. I started having panic attacks on planes and started isolating myself from work. I started having panic just going into the office. I started to taper off Ativan and ended up in the hospital. And I started seeing a psychiatrist. He switched my medications and the crazy started. I started seeing things like spirits in people, as if I was in another world. I paced the house for days trying to keep things from happening to my son. I thought someone was out to harm my family. Ended up they put me on Effexor and kept me on Lorazepam. I took a short-term leave of work. I thought I was losing my mind. In 2013, I returned to work for two months, and in June, they terminated my employment. I had been with the company 22 years. My wife left me after 25 years. I was having rage fits and uncontrollable fits of anger. I put myself in a six-week treatment facility where they took me off lorazepam in 10 days using gabapentin. In 2016, I applied for disability. I could not work. I was still seeing a group for depression. I was having pain in my legs and burning in my feet. I was told I had nerve damage and prescribed Lyrica. It did nothing to help the burning. In 2017, I moved to Charleston to be near my sons. Since 2013, our relationship had gone downhill. I would have psychotic episodes where I thought evil had taken over my mind. I saw things in people like mean spirits. I found a doctor who had worked with me to get off benzos. I have stopped completely with a slow taper from two milligrams to zero. I have good days and bad days where my nerves hurt in my shoulders. The best thing that happened was I got my mind busy. It was a slow process. My son told me to Uber. I wasn't sure what Uber was. I started a couple days a week. I found meeting people and getting out of the house helped me feel better. After nine months, I started a small business after meeting people from Ubering. I am still not where I want to be physically, but I am 100% better. I am building my relationship with my sons and my wife. My biggest frustration is I was never made aware that you could become dependent to benzos, and the withdrawal could cause mental and physical torment. Well, thank you, Rick. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I've, I've been corresponding with Rick via email since mid-June, and I really empathize with his story. So many of you have lost jobs and families during this crisis. I lost work and still struggle with this, but I was blessed to be able to keep my marriage intact. I can't imagine what losing your spouse and children, even if temporarily, does to our fragile emotional state. There, there's no winner or losers in these situations. And I'm so glad that Rick is now able to rebuild his family ties and his career prospects and move on with his life. Good luck with the new business. I'm so glad you are feeling better, Rick. And I really appreciate the success story. Keep healing and keep in touch. It's always good to hear from you. And don't forget, we still need stories, short ones, long ones, even if it's just a paragraph or two, I'd love to share it here. I still only have a few in the queue, so I need some for upcoming episodes, please. If you are thinking about sending one in, now's a good time. And as I mentioned earlier on, if I haven't thanked you for sending in your story, please know it's probably a mail issue that I'm having with my server, and I will try to reply to you as soon as I get things back online. To submit your story, just go to our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback or send an email to podcast at benzofree.org. And you still can submit your story in your own voice if you'd like. Instructions for that are on the feedback page. Now let's move on to our feature. Today our feature topic is muscular symptoms in benzo withdrawal. 
Muscular symptoms during withdrawal can include aches, seizures, convulsions, fatigue, jerks, pains, pulls, spasms, strains, stiffness, tears, ticks, tremors, twitches, and overall weakness. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Let's hear from a few of you regarding muscle-related symptoms. I went back through some of the stories that people had shared in this podcast and found a few things that were related to this topic. Here are a few of those. Nicole shared in her story the following. So, I stopped the Ativan cold turkey believing it would be fine because I didn't take it every day. I woke up the next day unable to walk because of muscle rigidity and was hospitalized for two weeks. I spent close to a year with physio, home care, and in and out of a wheelchair. Terry shared with us a while back the following. I currently have electricity running down my right arm a few times each day. It's a new symptom. Ain't life fun? My massage therapist has tied it to muscle tension in the neck area. These effects can also be chronic muscle tightness from withdrawal acting on the nerves themselves. And the final one is from an anonymous listener who speaks about the effects that these drugs have taken on her vocal cords. Finding treatment for newly diagnosed vocal cord nodules. I think muscle tension in the larynx area, thanks BZDs, led to strain on the cords and subsequent nodule development. A new resource is therefore in my future, speech pathologist. Learning how to relax these muscles and move air effortlessly is part of this specialty domain. Nobody seems spared by the effects of this class of medication. So that gives us a brief introduction to this class of symptoms. I want to thank those people for sharing their stories with us. Most benzos are very effective muscle relaxants. By the time the drugs are removed from your system, the muscles have been chemically relaxed for months or years. And now they need to figure out how to behave in this new drug-free environment. The removal of long-term muscle relaxants, in addition to damage to the nerves that signal the muscles, can create a painful cascade effect with some very bizarre results. Even the headaches I mentioned in earlier episodes might be partly attributed to muscle tension. People often describe these type of headaches as having a tight band around their head. Here's what Ashton says in the Ashton Manual about muscle issues. Benzodiazepines are efficient muscle relaxants and are used clinically for spastic conditions ranging from spinal cord disease or injury to the excruciating muscle spasms of tetanus or rabies. It is therefore not surprising that their discontinuation after long-term use is associated with a rebound increase in muscle tension. I had several pulls and strains during my tenure with withdrawal in my legs, arms, and chest. I would push myself too hard, which is so easy to do in withdrawal without even knowing it and I would pull something. And recovery can take longer than usual, a lot longer than usual in withdrawal, and it needs to be treated with kid gloves. Clenching of the teeth is another common muscle symptom. Pain in the jaw and teeth is often due to involuntary jaw clenching, which often occurs during sleep, although it can happen during the day too. I was fitted with a night guard early during my withdrawal by request from my dentist after he saw the damage I had done to my teeth. (laughs) Grinding of the teeth is common with chronic anxiety and can become worse during withdrawal. There are many nights and even days that I thought I was going to bite right through my night guard. I'm very grateful I have that now, and hopefully I'm saving my teeth. The good news is that most muscle symptoms are not harmful in the long term although my teeth might disagree. (laughs) But the bad news is that we do have to deal with them in the short term. Let's take a look at muscle spasms, cramps, tics, tremors, and twitches. These can be triggered by muscle fatigue or by misfiring of the nerves that triggers the muscles due to damage to the nervous system during withdrawal. 
Muscle spasms and cramps can be quite painful, but usually are short-lived. Anyone who has had a leg cramp can surely attest to this. And that includes me. I'm a drummer, and over the years I've built up my calf muscles from playing the drum set. When I get a cramp in my calf, I think I'm going to die. And these become more frequent during withdrawal. Oh, the joy. They are definitely more rare now, and I found hydration to be key to keeping them at bay. I do still get a lot of foot cramps, though, and those were new to me. They aren't nearly as painful as a leg or calf cramp, but they are aggravating and become very difficult. There are times when I can watch my foot or watch my toe just suddenly become distorted. And I just watch it until finally it eases and returns to normal. It's a bizarre process to watch. Thankfully, the toe cramps and most of the foot cramps aren't too bad and they will work themselves out. And sometimes rubbing them and working out the muscles or just moving helps them go away. Ticks, tremors, and twitches are also quite common for me, and I still get them quite frequently, mostly when I am stressed, though. You know, I'll just be sitting reading a book, and my shoulder or arm or leg or even abdomen will start twitching. It's usually benign, and it will only last for a few minutes, but it's kind of bizarre. Most of the time this happens when I've been stressed. And since I know the cause, it doesn't usually bother me too much, and I move on with my day. Muscle pain is another common one. Random pains throughout the body can occur with little or no cause. Since the most common causes of muscle pain is tension, stress, and overuse, it makes sense that removal of a medication which somewhat helped alleviate stress and tension, might make muscle pain worse. This is a common symptom for many people, and it can be a frightening one, which often sends us back to the doctor. This is especially true when the pain is in our chest, and we think we are having a heart attack. I had this one a lot. I had a combination of muscle tension and acid reflux which both cause pain in the chest, and both can be mistaken for heart attacks. I was diagnosed with recurring costochondritis during my withdrawal, which is inflammation of the cartilage that joins your rib muscles to the breastbone. It took me over a year to get that to calm down. That muscle pain, along with digestive discomfort, would often make me think I'm having a heart attack. I would lay awake for nights, just thinking, should I go? Should I go to the ER? Should I stay home? Eventually, most of the time, I would talk myself down and realize this is just another symptom. Let's take a look at seizures and convulsions. Seizures and convulsions often get confused with each other. Convulsions are uncontrollable muscle contractions. They can occur for a few seconds or several minutes. Seizures are an electrical disturbance in the brain. They can cause a person to have convulsions, but they don't always. According to the website Medical News Today, causes of convulsions vary from epileptic seizures, febrile seizures, which happen in childhood, non-epileptic seizures, which are still caused by electrical disturbances in the brain, but not by epilepsy, paroxysmal kinesogenic dyskinesia, or PKD, which is rare and typically happens after being startled, migraines, and medication reactions. Since benzodiazepines are sometimes prescribed as an anti-seizure medication, it follows that withdrawal can cause these symptoms in some people. It's important to remember that these are rare. They are most common in patients who withdrew too quickly and unlikely in those who taper slowly. Convulsions can accompany seizures in benzo withdrawal, but they also can occur independently. Temporary paralysis is also possible, but also rare. Ashton says the following about convulsions. Benzodiazepines are potent anticonvulsants. They can be life-saving in status epilepticus and in fits caused by overdose of certain drugs. 
However, rapid withdrawal, especially from high-potency benzodiazepines, can precipitate epileptic fits as a rebound reaction. According to a 2017 article in the Daily Mail, even the British National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE, warned that benzodiazepine withdrawal can cause confusion, toxic psychosis, convulsions, or a condition resembling delirium tremens, the latter referring to the symptoms seen in alcoholics. These are the extremes of the benzosymptomology spectrum. Few symptoms are as terrifying or dangerous, but please remember these are rare. Now let's take a look at treatment for these. Exercise is critical to a healthy recovery, but, but chronic muscle stiffness can make that difficult at times. And that is where stretching comes in. Most of the muscle issues can be handled by moderate stretching and limiting specific types of movement when needed. Avoid any strenuous workouts without proper stretching before and after. And listen to your body. Exercise if you can, but don't push it too hard. Your body is recovering and you need to let it. Be, be kind to your muscles. But being sedentary should only be a short-term solution. When you can get up and move, do so. Just take it slowly. Ease into it. The main thing here is to listen to your body. If you feel you are pushing it too hard, back off. But don't use that as an excuse to lay around all day. Do something different. Try and keep active. As I mentioned earlier, dehydration can be another factor in muscle health. Keeping hydrated can help your muscles heal and can help avoid spasms and cramps. Electrolyte imbalances can also be a factor here. Another option is physical therapy. It can be very helpful during this time, but you can also push it too far. I went to PT a few times during my withdrawal for costochondritis, pelvic floor dysfunction, and for some muscle pulls. The first time I went to the physical therapist, she put me on a normal treatment schedule and things got worse. It took a while for both of us to learn that my body no longer responds normally. In each case, I had to significantly reduce my treatment pace and temporarily lower my expectations. But the good news was, once we discovered I heal much slower and differently than the average person, I did heal and I found some exercises which worked for me. Other treatments that help muscle issues include hot baths. I actually took a lot of Epsom salt baths during my recovery. I found that it eased some of the muscle tension and relaxed me a little bit, especially just before sleep. Relaxation exercises also help. And massage. I found massage to be very helpful during my withdrawal and still go periodically for a tune-up. Our bodies can get so locked up and it's helpful to have a massage therapist who knows how to work with you and help you through it. I was blessed to find a really good massage therapist during my withdrawal. She happened to be a semi-pro volleyball player and had strong hands, which was great. It could work through the difficult muscle tissues when she needed to. And after I went to her a few times, she learned about me. She learned about what I was going through. I would tell her what I was dealing with. And we discovered massages that would help me. She helped me with the costal chondritis. She helped me with the pelvic floor dysfunction. She helped me with my muscle strains and pulls, and especially the tension in my neck and shoulders. And she was also somewhat diagnostic. She could identify muscles that were locked up, nerves that were pinched, and she could tell me where I'm carrying things and where the tension was. And that knowledge helped guide my exercises and stretching so I could relieve those areas of tension before they became worse. As I've said many times in this podcast, finding medical professionals to work with you is critical, but hard. I was lucky. I had a good doctor, 
I had a good massage therapist. I worked with a couple acupuncturists and I had some good counselors and many other specialists along the way. But all of it was trial and error. If I went to somebody who I didn't feel was working out for me, I moved on. I didn't waste my time. But when I did find somebody who was helpful, I told them about my condition. And they were happy to try to adjust my treatment to fit my condition. Muscle symptoms and benzo withdrawal can be very aggravating, especially the convulsions and the seizures and the muscle cramps and spasms. But all of them can be disconcerting. Again, it's important to remember where they come from, what's causing them. And it's also important to listen to your body and take things easy. Keep moving, but take it easy. This is your body healing. It may not be pleasant sometimes. It may even be painful sometimes. But if you help it along that path, you will recover. I hope that was helpful, and I hope that provided a little information about some of the different muscle symptoms within benzo withdrawal. And before we move on to our moment of peace, please bear with me for about 30 seconds for our disclaimer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical, health, or psychological advice, nor any other kind of personal or professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzo Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute. And it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. The way this works is that I will give a brief introduction, perhaps a suggestion of something to focus on. Then I will play a soft bell which will indicate the start of the one minute. This will be followed by another soft bell, which will indicate the end of the one minute. And that will be the end of the episode. Feel free to continue to meditate if you choose. If not, continue on with your day. Please remember that you should only do this if you are in a safe place, where you can close your eyes, relax, and let the world pass by without you for a minute. Today we are going to return to our mainstay, breathing meditation. I like to return to this one every now and then because it is the core of meditation practice. It's also the simplest of all meditation since all you need is the rhythm of your breath. Just focus on your breath as you inhale and as you exhale. Simple is good, especially in meditation. So let's get started. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. Let it out slowly, along with all the stress of the day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second, then let the breath out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just breathe slowly and naturally, and focus on the rhythm of your breath. Don't force it one way or the other. Just pay attention to it. And if your mind wanders, 
which it will, gently bring it back to your breath again. No judgment. Continue to do this for one minute. Our next episode is episode 30, and it will be released next Wednesday. Thank you again for joining me today, and please, let me know how we did. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.